to the Seagate Technology Fiscal First Quarter 2025 conference call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Shaney Hudson, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's call. Joining me are Dave Mosley, Seagate's Chief Executive Officer, and Gianluca Romano, our Chief Financial Officer. We've posted our earnings press release and detailed supplemental information for our September quarter results on the Investors section of our website. During today's call, we will refer to GAAP and non-GAAP measures. Non-GAAP figures are reconciled to GAAP figures in the earnings press release posted on our website and included in our Form 8K. We've not reconciled certain non-GAAP outlook measures because material items that may impact these measures are out of our control and or cannot be reasonably predicted. Therefore, reconciliation to the corresponding GAAP measures is not available without unreasonable effort. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that today's call contains forward-looking statements that reflect management's current views and assumptions based on information available to us as of today, should not re be re relied upon as of any subsequent date. Actual results may differ materially from those contained in or implied by these forward-looking statements as they are subject to risks and uncertainties associated with our business. To learn more about the risks uncertainties, and other factors that may affect our future business results, please refer to the press release issued today and our SEC filings, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly report on Form 10-Q, as well as the supplemental information, all of which may be found on the investor section of our website. Following our prepared remarks, we'll open the call up for questions. In order to provide all analysts with the opportunity to participate, we thank you in advance for asking one primary question and then re-entering the queue. I'll now hand the call over to you, Dave. Thank you, Shaney, and hello, everyone. Seagate delivered a strong start to the fiscal year, with revenue growing nearly 50% and non-GAAP gross profit increasing over 150% compared to with the prior year period. These results demonstrate our ability to drive profitable growth, which is the outcome of sustained supply discipline and the strategic cost efficiencies that we have built into our operations. Fiscal first quarter revenue came in at $2.17 billion and non-GAAP EPS was $1.58. Both were above the midpoint of our guidance range, benefiting from a better than anticipated mass capacity product mix and an improved pricing environment. Continuing cloud demand strength, coupled with improvement in the enterprise and OEM markets, drove top line growth and also contributed to enhanced profitability. Company non-GAAP gross margin expanded by 240 basis points sequentially to 33.3%, the highest level in over a decade. This impressive performance was driven by our HDD business with non-GAAP gross margins now in the mid-30% range. Amid a healthy industry supply demand environment, we anticipate further mar margin expansion opportunities as we ramp our portfolio of high-capacity nearline drives, including our mosaic-based hammer products, which I'll discuss shortly. The increasingly favorable business landscape, combined with our industry-leading technology roadmap, lends growing confidence in Seagate's future opportunities. Reflecting this confidence, we are increasing our quarterly dividend by nearly 3%. Our optimism is reinforced by our build-to-order model, which provides us with good demand visibility over the next few quarters. We see the potential for significant revenue growth for fiscal 2025, inclusive of the seasonal demand fluctuation that is typical for the March quarter. We are maintaining supply discipline, and we'll address near-term exabyte demand growth by efficiently leveraging our available capacity. Beyond that, we are well positioned to support further demand growth, 
mainly through technology node transitions, with Hammer playing a vital role as we complete qualifications and ramp shipments. Turning to the mass capacity market trends, cloud demand for our nearline drives remains robust, and we believe customers are managing their inventory levels well. In the September quarter, revenue growth was driven by U.S. cloud providers, though we continue to see positive demand trends globally. For instance, some customers have highlighted the growing use of video content on e-commerce and social media platforms. Data indicates that video is the most effective format for engaging digital audiences. Furthermore, research suggests that longer form video content and personalization through AI technology can significantly enhance revenue generation opportunities for our customers. These trends bode well for mass capacity HDDs which are ideally suited for storing large and diverse data-intensive video content. HDDs comprise close to 90% of bytes stored in public cloud environments, and we are confident that proportion will hold for the foreseeable future. Among enterprise and OEM customers, we observe the first meaningful uptick in nearline demand following a multi-quarter period of stability. This increase reflects an improvement in traditional server demand as well as higher storage content per unit, pushing the average capacity per enterprise drive to a new record high. In the VIA markets, sales remain stable in the September quarter and slightly ahead of our expectations. We are witnessing a shift towards more cloud-like storage solutions that utilize higher capacity drives. This transition is due in part to longer data retention needs and increased video analytics. Our HDD solutions, including Mosaic Hammer products, provide cost efficiency and scalability to our VIA customers' evolving demands. These same advantages are also crucial for generative AI applications, which is why we continue to believe Gen AI will be a driver of mass capacity storage simply by being a powerful catalyst for data creation. HDDs provide a trusted, economical, and secure platform to host data that feeds into AI engines and preserves the content produced by AI-powered applications. This data is ultimately fed back into the AI training models in a continuous cycle. As data center architects prepare for Gen AI to move into the widespread adoption phase, they continue to grapple with cost, scale, and power challenges. Seagate's product roadmap is addressing each of these key challenges. Compared with NAND-based storage alternatives, our HDD solutions offer approximately six times lower cost per terabyte, and HDDs are roughly nine times more capital efficient, delivering the economies of scale necessary to support the anticipated surge in data demand. And according to cloud customers, HDDs have 10 times lower embodied carbon per terabyte relative to NAND, which can translate into a much lower carbon footprint, very important given the world's growing number of data centers. That provides a good segue into our product ramp and qualification plans. We have three primary areas of focus for fiscal 2025 aimed at driving profitable growth over the long term, and we're progressing on all of them. They include ramping the company's last PMR platform, expanding Mosaic adoption, and executing our Mosaic product roadmap that will enable Seagate to address the breadth of customers' mass capacity storage needs. Consistent with our plans, we began to aggressively ramp our final PMR platform in the September quarter, which is currently up to 28 terabytes in capacity. We are very pleased with the pace of customer adoption. These drives have quickly catapulted to our second highest revenue product, and we are continuing to both ramp volume and broaden our customer base in the December quarter. We've expanded customer qualifications on our three plus terabyte per disk mosaic hammer based platform with a few customer quals already completed spanning the enterprise nearline, VIA and NAS market segments. The qualification with our lead CSP customer is progressing well through what has been a very intensive and thorough testing process. The learnings that we have gained are already being leveraged into future customer qualifications and product generations. To that end, Hammer qualification drives are now in the hands of multiple global cloud and enterprise customers. 
Our expectation for shipment and revenue ramp timing across the broader customer base still points to mid-calendar 2025. Our confidence in hammer technology remains strong, and customer feedback has reinforced our value proposition that the Mosaic platform provides the foundational technologies required to satisfy high-capacity storage requirements at the lowest total cost of ownership. We expect to extend our technology leadership as we deliver on the next stage of our Hammer Roadmap, the four plus terabyte per disk platform. As a reminder, the step function capacity increase to four terabytes per disk is being achieved entirely through aerial density gains, supporting our cost per terabyte reduction path with additional benefit to both customer TCO and Seagate's structurally improved margin profile. In closing, Seagate is performing well amid an improving demand backdrop with healthy industry supply dynamics. We are at an exciting inflection point rooted in the structural changes we've made to our business and with our compelling technology roadmap. These factors underpin our ability to build on the last four quarters of strong sequential performance and drive future profitable growth to create long-term value for our customers and stakeholders. Thank you, and I'll now hand it off to Gianluca. Thank you, Dave. Seagate started fiscal 2025 delivering strong revenue and profitability growth for a fourth consecutive quarter. September quarter revenue was $2.17 billion, up 15% sequentially and 49% year over year. We increased non gap operating income 35% sequentially to $442 million translating to non-GAAP operating margin of 20.4% of revenue. And our non-GAAP EPS was $1.58 at the high end of our guidance range and reflecting improving demand trends, ongoing price adjustment, and continued cost discipline. Within our hard disk drive business, exabyte shipments grew 20% sequentially to 138 exabytes and revenue increased 16% to $2 billion. Mass capacity revenue grew for the fifth consecutive quarter, more than offsetting the expected decline in the legacy business. Mass capacity revenue was $1.7 billion, up 21% sequentially, driven by continuous strength in nearline cloud demand, along with a significant uptick in nearline enterprise sales. Mass capacity shipment total 128 exabytes compared with 104 exabytes in the June quarter, up 23% sequentially. Mass capacity shipments now represent a record 93% of total HDD exabytes, reflecting the continued long term secular growth for cost efficient scalable storage. As planned, we began to ramp our 24 and 28 terabyte PMR, which helped to boost Seagate nearline shipment to 109 exabytes in the quarter, up from 84 exabytes in the prior period. As Dave highlighted earlier, customer reception for this product has been strong and represented more than 20% of our nearline revenue in the September quarter. We expect nearline demand will continue to improve in the December quarter as shipment for our latest high-capacity products broaden across global CSP and enterprise customers. Demand for our VIA products remain relatively stable in the September quarter, and we currently project similar revenue in the December quarter. Smart City projects remain a key demand driver for VIA products worldwide, and regional economic conditions play a key factor in budget decision for the new projects. The ongoing economic uncertainties in China have been an headwind for the VIA business in that market. We are cautiously optimistic that a recently announced stimulus plan in China could positively impact on VIA demand over time. Sales of our legacy products total $270 million representing roughly 12% of total revenue. The remaining 8% of revenue was derived from our other businesses, which held steady 
at $164 million. The other businesses include system, SSD, and refurbished drives, a business that has grown by about 25% year over year and includes drives under our circularity programs. Moving on to the rest of the income statement, non-GAAP gross profit increased 24% sequentially in the September quarter to $723 million. This significant increase reflects a favorable mix shift toward mass capacity products, continued price adjustment, and ongoing cost efficiency in an improving demand environment. Our resulting non-GAAP gross margin was 33.3% at the company level. Overall non-GAAP gross margin expanded by 240 basis points quarter over quarter, which was slightly more than we had originally anticipated. Non-GAAP gross margin for the HTD business and mass capacity in particular remains significantly higher than the corporate average. Non-GAAP operating expenses totaled $281 million, up 10% quarter over quarter, and above our original plan, largely due to higher variable compensation commensurate with improved profitability levels. Other income and expense were $86 million, and we project similar levels in the December quarter. Adjusted EBITDA continued to improve and was up 23% sequentially in the September quarter to $498 million. Non-GAAP net income increased to $337 million, resulting in non-GAAP EPS of $1.58 per share, based on a diluted share count of approximately 213 million shares. Moving on to cash flow and the balance sheet, free cash flow generation was $27 million, reflecting our initial steps to normalize working capital to support our supply chain, while at the same time meeting increasing mass capacity demand. It will take a couple more quarters for working capital to fully adjust, which will have some impact to free cash flow generation. Even so, we expect free cash flow to improve in the December quarter and through the rest of the fiscal year. Capital expenditures for the quarter were $68 million. For fiscal 25, we will maintain capital discipline and continue to expect CapEx to be at the low end of the long-term target range of 4 to 6% of revenue. We returned $147 million to shareholders through the quarterly dividend exiting the quarter with 211 million shares outstanding. As Dave mentioned earlier, the company approved an increase to our quarterly dividend, raising the quarterly payout to 72 cents per share and reflecting our long-term confidence in the business. We closed the September quarter with $2.7 billion in available liquidity, including our undrawn revolving credit facility. Inventory increased to $1.4 billion, including material that we are staging in support of improving mass capacity demand. Our debt balance was $5.7 billion at the end of the September quarter, with more than 90% of our long-term debt obligation maturing in fiscal 27 and beyond. We exited the quarter with a net leverage ratio of 3.2 times and expect to see further reduction in the coming quarters. Turning now to our outlook, mass capacity revenue continues to trend higher, with growth driven by global cloud customer demand for our high-capacity nearline drives, along with ongoing improvement in the enterprise and OEM markets. These positive trends are expected to more than offset lower sales into the legacy and other markets. We anticipate profits to further expand from the richer mix of mass capacity revenue that I just described, and ongoing pricing actions. With that as a context, December quarter revenue is expected to be in a range of $2.3 billion plus or minus $150 million. As a midpoint, this represents an increase of 6% sequentially and 48% year over year. Non-GAAP operating expenses are expected to be in the range of $285 million. At the midpoint of our revenue guidance, we expect non-GAAP operating margin 
to expand into the low 20s percentage range. We expect our non-GAAP EPS to be $1.85 plus or minus 20 cents, based on a diluted share count of approximately 214 million shares and a non-GAAP tax expense of about $20 million. I will now turn the call back to Dave for final comments. Thanks, John Luca. In closing, Seagate is achieving significant profitability expansion in a favorable demand environment. I'm confident that the structural improvements we have implemented and our differentiated technology roadmap will further enhance said profitability and meet the evolving requirements of our customers. Demand for our high capacity near line drives remains strong and we will build on that momentum to deliver scalable, cost efficient storage solutions to support the anticipated growth in data demand, including from Gen AI applications. Seagate's dedicated global team, strong business model, and technology leadership form a winning combination that positions us well for future success and underscores our confidence in deploying capital and enhancing value for our shareholders. Operator, let's now open up the call for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. In the interest of time, we ask that you limit yourself to one question. If you have further questions, you may re-enter the question queue. Once again, that was star, then one to ask a question. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And our first question today comes from Wamzi Mohan with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, Dave was wondering uh, if you could flush out a little bit your, your commentary around uh, this bill to order and very good demand visibility into, into uh, this fiscal year. Uh, you noted significant demand growth, including uh, some seasonality that you typically expect around, around March quarter. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a bit on, on maybe uh, some bookends around what you're thinking around demand growth. Is March quarter seasonality going to be different from what you've experienced before? And I'd be curious to also hear your thoughts around, if I could, the how you're expecting to compete versus your competitors' products, which have slightly higher capacities um, currently as you're ramping Hammer. It sounds like Hammer gets there sort of mid-next year in volume. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wamsi. Um, so a couple things. If I go back at six months ago or a year ago, we instilled these build-to-order models largely to get predictability, and I think it's working well. Um, as we look into the next year, we're confident that we've booked those quarters pretty well. So I'm I'm very happy the way we're running the business with given that predictability, and we're only going to build what we what we need to build. You know, we're still not fully recovered as an industry from what we just went through a couple of years ago. So I'm quite pleased with how the build to order models have gone. There is some seasonality in some markets as you allude to, uh, and we'll watch that carefully. But you know, I think everyone is a little cautious on next year. From a cloud perspective, I don't think inventory has built up any, I think the buffers are still low uh, from my perspective. And, and uh, so I, I think we are happy with the cloud predictability, the mass capacity predictability uh, from here. On the second part, I, I think uh, from a capacity point leadership perspective, we're shipping the leading products. So, you know, from a CMR perspective, no one else is shipping over 30 terabytes for sure. And as we you know, mentioned in the prepared remarks, there's capacity points even higher than that going up. And if we put SMR on top of that, we can fall even higher. So um, I'm very comfortable with our positions there. Uh, so I'm not quite sure exactly what you're referring to on you know, capacity leadership or lack of leadership. I mean, I, from our perspective, we've got to get all the quals and all the ramps done and, and so on. And then you know, we get on to four terabytes of disk and so on. We're very comfortable with our technology portfolio that way. Thanks, Dave. Our next question comes from Krish Sankar with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, thanks for taking my question. Dave, I had a question on your market share. You know, historically, you're more in the mid-40s, but last few quarters, it's kind of dipped down to a 30% or high 30% range. Can you talk about the factors that are behind this low share? Is it potential disruption from Hammer causing temporary share loss? Is it customer-specific where WD's customers are ordering more than yours? Um, and along the same path, how to think about the industry pricing in calendar 25? It's been extremely rational in HDD. How to think about it in 2025? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, for market share, I've said a number of times, market share is an outcome of running your play. And, I, and, and exactly to Wamsi's question, we we changed our plays a year ago when we said we want these built of orders. So we we said I want predictability, uh, you know, a longer time horizon rather than we're building a bunch and then hoping to push it into a channel and that, you know going for market share or something like that. Um, I think when we were at the bottom of the demand cycle, uh, market share doesn't really matter. It's more the predictability of the cash that you're generating and so on. Um, as we get back into things, you know, obviously we're taking, now that the margins are higher, we're getting rewarded for the money that we extend and the investments we've made and so on, then, you know, we'll clearly take more, uh, more of that demand our way. Um, and so I think the, the market share will re-equilibrate. From an exabyte share perspective, I think, you know, we'll just be just fine because you know, as customers want to continue to push the TCO proposition going to higher and higher capacity points, I think, we're going to be fine there. On the pricing side, I think I'll, I'll let John Luca yeah. answer the question there. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I think uh, the pricing environment continues to be uh, positive for the industry. You know, every quarter we have seen a little bit of improvement, and this is what is also driving our gross margin uh, higher a little bit every quarter. As you know, on the cost side, we still had some unused capacity in the June quarter, and in September quarter, uh, we don't have any of those extra costs, so we also had a little bit of that uh, help in uh, in the gross margin. And going into December, if you look at how we got it, we expect further improvement in uh, in gross margin, further improvement in operating margin, that is, of course, very important to us. And that is coming from the mix, uh, ramping more of our latest PMR product. Of course, we also have a certain volume of hammer in our December quarter, and uh, and the pricing action that is still ongoing, and uh, you know, we have a, a good balance between supply and demand in general for Seagate and I think for the industry, and uh, we are continuing for our uh, long-term strategy. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, John Luca. Thanks. And our next question comes from Amit Dariyanani with Evercore. Please go ahead. Yep. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, you know, I guess my, my question really, Dave, is around there's always this fear that the HCD industry broadly, Seagate specifically, are sitting at these cyclical peak levels. Uh, I'd love to get your perspective as you look at the exabyte shipments that you have right now. You know, how do you get confidence that what you're shipping is actually getting deployed by your customers versus perhaps ending up in inventory for them? How do you kind of gain that confidence? And then really relate to that cyclical fear, I would say, you folks sound very confident that there's a lot more upside to gross margins versus where you are today, which is actually about your long-term target. Uh, what do you think is the appropriate margin framework for Seagate as you go forward now? Thanks, Amit. Um, yes, we have run a cyclical business over the many, many years. I think it's changed quite a bit as we came down, down from client server. You know, there used to be a lot of seasonality in that market, and now as we're in the cloud, the cyclicality, I, I'm not sure it's, Total, totally periodical, but you know, the the pandemic in particular caused a very big bubble, and then a big crash on the backside of it. So I think that's kind of an anomaly there. Um, how do we know uh, what customers actually have? We have to triangulate ourselves, and and um, you know, I think we've really improved our processes for for being able to do that. Uh, to, but we're also not pushing in nearly as many drives, total units, uh, or uh, exabyte uh, points, and some of the, so the build-to-order model actually helps us with quite a bit, so that we we know that we're not overbuilding if you were planning to overbuild. Uh, exactly to your point on upsides to gross margin, I mean, we believe that the way we bring on more capacity is to drive for more aerial density gains, and 
uh, we have to go work the costs on those platforms, and that's what we're really focused on doing, making sure that we can introduce you know, terabytes in the 20s and 30s and 40s with lower and lower costs to be able to serve the market. A good TCO proposition for our customers who are building data centers and want to support data centers for a long time is, is to put more, more capacity online because it's so much more efficient for them. But, you know, we need to be able to get that efficiency through our continued cost reduction also. So I do think there's significant uh, upside to gross margin still. Uh, but it all starts, to your point, with supply and demand, uh, managing supply and demand properly. And our next question today comes from Eric Woodring with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you guys for, uh, for taking my question. Um, John Luca, may maybe if we just um, stay in the theme of gross margins here, you know, I think your guidance for the, uh, for the December quarter implies about a 34% gross margin, uh, up roughly 70 basis points sequentially. Y you've been growing gross margins by about two to four points sequentially over the last four quarters. And so I'm just wondering if, if pricing and mix are still favorable, and obviously Dave just made some positive comments on gross margins. Can, can you help me understand why we might not be seeing more gross margin expansion uh, in the quarter, again, relative to the, the, the multiple points of gross margin expansion you've been able to drive over the last uh, 12 months? Thanks so much. Yes, Eric. Well, as I said before, in the September quarter, we also had the support from better cost structure because of the you know, higher capacity and uh, the elimination of the underutilization charges. That was about 100 basis points in our gross margin improvement. Uh, we are not going to have that uh, uh, improvement in the December quarter because now we don't have any underutilization charges anymore. But we are still progressing with our pricing structure and we are making a good ramp of our latest PMR product, and we will see some volume on Hammer. So all those are positive, and as you know, we, we guide based on uh, on a forecast that we have at the beginning of the quarter, and then we execute during the quarter as best as, as best as we can. And our focus is to keep improving quarter after quarter. We are not not try to increase. Uh, too much at, the, at one time. We want to be consistent and uh, keep this cycle up for uh, not for uh, as long as we can. And our next question today comes from Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for taking the question. Um, I had a multi-part one on Hammer. I think on the last call or at a conference, you guys talked about um, your expectation around getting qualification at your lead customer in, in Q3, I, I believe. Um, is that now Q4? Is that early 25? Uh, any thoughts on that would be helpful. And then, Dave, you, you talked about additional cloud companies uh, or customers having um, qualification um, products on hand. Should we expect the qualification process at some of those customers to be smoother than your lead customer given sort of the debugging process that you've been through over the past year or so? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Toshia. Yeah, the, the failure mode that slowed us down as we ramped to high volume this spring and summer is, is behind us. Um, the teams worked really hard to make sure we get all the process improvements that we talked about last time in. Um, I did speak on last earnings call about the our confidence was based on the test beds that we have running that are all designed to detect these fill modes with you know intense stresses that are way beyond our spec and and here we are another quarter later we have more drives more configurations running uh, more modes of test and we haven't seen hide nor hair of the failure mode so we, we're confident that it's behind us that's that initial learning that we get Relative to proving it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time with the customers to prove it, but I, I'm confident we're going to be able to prove it right now, and those tests are ongoing. Um, I, the customers know exactly where we are. That when we think about qualifications, there's a lot of different facets of quals. It's interoperability in different data center applications and so on and so forth. No, no significant concerns there. It really does come down to this one last issue, and, and that's why we have confidence that, confidence that no one else is going to see it, because as we ramp to high volume, um, those other customers, we've got this problem fixed. I'd say those other customers weren't. Some uh, 
multiple non-cloud customers have already qualified the product and already we're already getting volume shipments there. They run tough quals themselves, but may not have these same kinds of stresses. But now that we have the recipe, I think we're going to apply it everywhere. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Asia Merchant with Citigroup. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, as, we, as you guys ramp hammer, you know, and you start to see more qualifications and more shipments, let's say here in December and into the March, um, how, is, is that a negative to gross margins just given, you know, the shipment volumes are lower, the, you know, there might be some ramp issues there. How should we think about overall impact to margins as hammer ramps? And I get the sense that, you know, obviously once you guys are much further along, that's a margin driver. But near term, how should we think about the impact to margins from hammer ramping? Thank you. Thanks, Sia. Yeah. yeah, near term, we don't want to give it away. Long term, we don't want to give it away. So, you know, we definitely want hammer to be accretive to gross margin, and we think it does add benefit to our customers as well. So there's a trade-off, you know, do, do they want to, uh, you know, increase the higher the capacity for the data center build-outs that they're doing, and then we have to say, you have to make sure you pay for it to replace the drives. As, as we said before, our factories are largely full, so, you know, to take drives out of those, or take the supply out and turn it over to Hammer, we have to make sure we're getting paid for it. And I'm confident we can do that in the near term as well. Uh, it's just a matter of managing the supply and demand picture properly. Yeah, I'll say on the cost side, a similar level of volume, Hammer cost per terabyte is below the PMR cost per terabyte. So for sure there is an advantage on Hammer. And the pricing, of course, depends from you know, the timing and uh, and where we are in the cycle, but no, at this point in the short term, um, there is no reason why Hammer should not be accretive to our gross margin. And our next question today comes from Aaron Rakers with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah, th thanks for taking a question. Thanks for taking a question. So a couple just real quick uh, model questions. It looks like your OPEX was a little bit higher than you expected in this quarter. I'm curious, is you know, relative to the 285 million guide, how do we think about the trajectory of operating expenses uh, as we look out into the March quarter or beyond? Any kind of framework uh, of what kind of we could think about from a normalizing operating expense perspective? And then, as you know, the the, the kind of quick follow-up as you as you get the I think it's 480 million of debt maturing in January, you know, from that level, you know, how are you thinking about the, the possibility of of re-entering, you know, share repurchase activity uh, going forward? Yes, on the OPEX, the increase between June and September is only uh, due to variable compensation. So we are not hiring more people. It's just a matter of, you know, last year we didn't have variable comp, and this year we have variable comp at a fairly good level. So from here, I would say probably we stay fairly flat through the rest of the fiscal year, around the you know, 280 to 285. I think that is uh, that is a new range. The debt, uh, as you said, is maturing in uh, beginning of January. So as we said before, we are going to address that with uh, cash on end. So we start reducing our debt. We want to be even a little bit lower. Uh, before we restart share buyback. So I would say, as you know, we have increased dividend. That is a top priority for the company. And then we want to take care of the debt. And then after that, we will look at share buyback, probably you know, a little bit farther in time. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question today will come from Timothy Arcuri with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, I had a question about the capacity outlook now, given that you're kind of bumping up against your uh, your your max, uh, you know, today. So um, so unless you decide to add more, you're I mean you're going to ship close to that 130 exabyte of um, of you know near line, you know, probably not in December, but but you know quite soon. So I mean you've grown nicely off the bottom on mix and on you know exabytes coming back, but if you're not going to expand. Uh, a, a capacity, should we think of things starting to flatten off from here? And, you know, I realize that pricing is going to go up, but 
Um, but it seems like you kind of lose a uh, you know degree of freedom in the model unless you start to expand exabyte capacity. Thanks. Yeah, Tim, I think the, exactly to your point, we'll, we'll expand exabyte capacity by transitioning to new products. And uh, so if you think about it, uh, as I go to from 20 terabytes-ish to 30 terabytes-ish to even 40, you know, someday we'll, we'll be able to expand exabyte capacity without adding significant capacity from a driver, heads, or media perspective. Uh, we'll just use it much more efficiently on an exabyte basis. And you know that's where um, we're confident that we'll be able to also take out cost at those higher capacity points, uh, which is what builds into the margin proposition into the into the model. And our next question today comes from C.J. Muse with Cantor Fitzgerald. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question, Dave. Uh, in your prepared remarks, you talked about good visibility for growth in fiscal 25, notwithstanding seasonality for March. So I was hoping you could kind of speak to, you know, where your visibility is today uh, for Nearline. Is, is it three, six, nine months? And then, you know, based on that uh, backdrop, how should we be thinking about, um, at least for mass capacity, what seasonality will look like into the March quarter? Yeah, I think uh, mass capacity is pretty full, uh, and it goes out that nine-month period that you talked about, CJ, um, and that's a virtue of the build-to-order model that we've actually established, and I think customers understand that. They get you know predictable economics, and, and we're all going through these qualification uh, processes so they get access to that technology as well. That's, that's all serving as well. I, I think, uh, you know, right now, I would say the – Total demand is not um, is not significantly higher than you know historical demands, and I, and I certainly don't think there's inventory buildup going in or anything. So I don't think there's a cycle coming. I think we're running a fairly predictable uh, business, and we'll get better visibility as we get through. You know, obviously early next year, people are you know re-upping, if you will, the the uh, build order uh, configurations, but. Right now, I feel fairly confident, certainly through the front half of the year and probably even into the back half of the year. Yeah, on the seasonality, CJ, usually the majority of the seasonality is on the legacy part of the business, where the March quarter is the lower uh, quarter, the lowest quarter in, uh, in the year. But we also have part of mass capacity, in particular via so the surveillance part of the business, that is usually fairly weak in March, and they start to grow in June, and is fairly strong in September and December. So when you model you know, your uh, your four quarters for Canada 25, you know, consider that very seasonality, not only in the legacy part, but also in, in some of the um, mass capacity products. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Stephen Fox with Fox Advisors, LLC. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Good afternoon, guys. I guess just following up on the um, point on how much capacity you have available, I think I understand how you create capacity when you go from like three terabytes per platter to four. But from here, going over, say, the next 12 months, I think last quarter you talked about the bottlenecking. There's a potential that maybe you do get a better cycle in enterprise and via next year. Like, how do we how do we get comfortable with the idea that you can manage all that and still satisfy all your customer needs? Or any any further call on that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a it's a question, a good question about how big could things get if the edge really turns on, if you know, Gen AI, AI turns on, which you know I would say is still very very early innings of that. Um, you know, if there's some kind of macro recover, recovery in all the markets, um, and uh, we're we're not there yet. We're still being very cautious on any supply, um, and any additional supply we would have to put on would be very long lead time. Uh, so I, we can satisfy more exabytes exactly as you described, and we've talked about earlier. But um, but you know, additional drive demand, if you will, I think we'd we'd have to add supply, which would be longer, much longer lead time. As we spend 4% of, of uh, our revenue on CapEx, 
We do add technology transition capacity, so you get some small capacity adds because of that. As you're buying new tools, they're mo they tend to be more efficient. Um, but it, the, the growth would be necessarily slow, I think. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Ananda Baruha with Loop Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, guys. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I guess, Dave, sort of sticking right there on the capacity question, you know, if, if things progress as you anticipate with Hammer, in the event that even with Hammer and aerial density increases, um, you know, sort of data increases, you know, Gen AI, video apps, et cetera, you know, all of that, were to put you in a position where you were, where you were to want to be uh, increasing capacity. What you just mentioned long lead times, what is that process? Can you give us some sense of what that process could look like? You know, we've also heard about, you know, there's kind of the whole component change that you have uh, also needs to be tended to. I guess just what would be the ways that you, you, you guys could maybe get it that? That, that'd be helpful. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Ananda. Um, I, I think that we fixate in our industry on the highest capacity point, and obviously, you know, that that's the max capacity gets a lot of attention. But you know, when you get into the the growth of some of these other markets, we would be talking about twenty terabytes, or you know, maybe even less than that. You know, what's your value prop at that level? And by pushing forward in aerial density, we get to take components out of those those uh, capacity points. So we can actually hit much more aggressive price bands uh, if we want to and still maintain really good margins. And then those components that are freed up go, you know, you can make twice as many drives with half the components going being dedicated to each drive, right? So, so you know, I think that's where uh, if we saw a resurgence, yeah, aerial density helps solve a lot of problems because you can go address those markets that are, you know, half capacity, if you will, of the max capacity uh, in a much more efficient way. I got it. That's that's super helpful. Then, and just to complete that, does that mean like even in like a strong case with Hammer, you you guys feel pretty good when you sort of map out ability to hit you know exabyte shifts for the industry uh, for. Uh, for a good amount of time to come. I mean, measured in probably years, not months. Well, it depends, right? We have uh, we have our supply plan. We you know if uh, demand is much higher than our supply plan, of course, we we will have a little bit of uh, unbalance that we have time to address. But our focus is on technology transition, is not on more units, and uh, we think this is the most profitable way for uh, the industry to progress in this period of time, and this is what we want to do. So let's see where demand is in two or three quarters from now, but we know where our supply will be. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. And our next question today comes from Vijay Rakesh with Mizuho. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Dave. Uh, on the hammer, just wondering if you guys gave a uh, size, uh, what do you think unit shipments could be for 225? Uh, and Gianluca, I think in the past we talked about trying to bring on some of the idle cap capacity and headcount as you, you know, start to bring some of the uh, capacity back on. Can you lay out how that roadmap looks, looks like? Thanks. Thanks, BJ. Uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't speak specifically about how many units and how fast we'll push. We just we said that you know mass qualification will be done for all these customers that we just shipped to probably by mid-2025. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, the factories are relatively full right now, and so as we plan with those customers and they say, hey, I'd like the exabytes in this form rather than this form, we'll, we'll make the transition, but it'll be probably a, less of a transition than we would have made, you know, say a year ago when we had empty factories, we would have uh, ramped much more aggressively. This time, I, I think we'll, you know, we'll make sure that we pivot accordingly uh, and carefully. It's very important that to realize that the components that we use in our last generation of PMR product 
are very, very similar to the components we use in Hammer as well. So not, not the critical components, heads and media, obviously, but all the other components. And so we, we feel very comfortable being able to pivot from one product to the other if we have to. The mechanics, the electronics, there's so much leverage there. Um, so that, that's what allows us that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, from a idle capacity standpoint, I would say at, at this point we don't have much idle capacity anymore. Um, so what we are doing is now moving faster into technology transition. Now with our latest PMR product that we are ramping very aggressively already in the September and December quarter, and then the transition to Emmer will generate no certain level of additional exabytes that. Uh, would support the increase in demand. Right. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, And our next question today comes from Thomas O'Malley with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Dave, uh, if you would just, just humor me um, as I try to clarify things here. But just in the back half, it sounds like you are fully at capacity and technology transitions are, are getting you some growth. And it sounds like that looks really good. It's obviously been a couple of really good quarters for you guys. But let's just say we head out into fiscal year 26. You're talking about more volume for Hammer kind of coming in the middle of the next calendar year. And so you would imagine more substantially into the next fiscal year for you guys. If you guys were to see further delays on the Hammer side, what actions would you guys take just given the fact that you're at capacity and wouldn't, you know, from a, a factory perspective and you wouldn't see the technology transitions. Just walk me through what you would do in that instance. Obviously, that's not ideal and you're not planning for that, but we've seen the, the qualifications slip a couple quarters with the largest guy. So just want to understand how you guys think about things if, if it's further delayed. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really worried about it for exactly the reasons that you talked about. We, we see the, how the test beds are running, we see how the qualifications are running, and we're, we're very confident in being able to make the pivot. But exactly to the earlier question, I think it was Vijay's question, um, you know, we can pivot from the last generation PMR to the, the Hammer tr technology very, very easily. And last generation PMR is a great product for us with really good margins uh, that we're not fully ramped on yet either. So um, from that perspective, if it came to, to like one quarter of delay and some customer said, I want it like this rather than like this, we can very easily pivot back. Helpful. And then in terms of just your, your outlook on AI, you obviously made some comments earlier on the call. Um, you're saying it's still kind of on the come. In terms of, you know, initial conversations with customers, do you have a time frame of when you may start to see some contribution there? Is that something that would come as early as this next fiscal year? Yeah, I think so. This, this is a really complex topic because, you know, I think there's a lot of different things uh, that are called AI. Um, some of them are traditional workloads that we've seen for years and years, and some of them are brand new workloads. And we are seeing demand that's coupled to brand new workloads, right, with, you know, purchase orders that reference specifically things that people would would identify as, as predictive AI or gen AI applications. Um, what I would say is that the recent trends are really more towards video, which we talked about in our uh, prepared remarks, and that's the biggest thing that we're seeing right now um, grow, and I'll, I'll call that AI uh, for a while because I think it is uh, a much more efficient way to drive cus our customers' business models, and that's we, we see that demand flowing through right now. I don't think that there's a bubble going on in there. I think there's a continued uh, value uh, uh, competition happening in, in a bunch of different uh, vectors with new technologies, new applications coming that uh, you know, could continue to drive video as a, as a uh, you know, fundamental value store for, for our customers. And that's why we're excited about it. And you know, I know some people call those traditional workloads but you know, I'll, I'll give credit to AI because I think they're being used in very interesting, creative new ways. Our next question today comes from Mark Miller with the Benchmark Co. Please go ahead. Uh, congratulations on your upside results and, and your good guidance. I just want to go back to AI and the opportunity there. Um, do, you, do you believe that uh, PCs with uh, AI chips will drive a major refresh cycle, and if so, when? Second half of next year? Yeah, because Mark, I don't have a ton of visibility into that, although I do talk to some of these customers that I grew up with about that exact topic. 
Um, I, look, I think that uh, the PC space has been relatively slow to adopt new applications of late, and I think there, that's about to change. Uh, how quickly it'll change is still uh, anybody's guess, and of course, it's not about specking new hardware, it's about specking new applications that come. And most of those applications are, to your point, they're video applications. So yes, I do think that when you can enable creative professionals certainly to uh, do, um, to create, um, especially video, but audio counts as well, and you know, uh, uh, all kinds of other analytical tools that happen at the edge, you allow them to create much more aggressively, I think they'll spin off more data. Um, some of that data will be serviced by the cloud service providers that already are, and so you know we see those applications growing. But some of it may be closer to the edge, and we're really excited about that. It's still very early, but um, and I can't really predict where AI PCs are going to be just yet. But I think uh, from what I'm seeing from application development, I'm excited about it. And I think it is going to be a driver in the near future. Okay, just one uh, other question. You mentioned there was little idle capacity at the moment. Uh, what is the factory utilization in your hidden media fabs? Are they the 85% or higher? Uh, yeah, fairly high in both. Uh, you know, I think we, we do have capacity as we uh, transition to Hammer. We, we can, because we've, you know, dedicated a lot of that space to uh, experiments, if you will, in the last uh, few years. And so now some of that can become production instead of experimentation. Um, but, but uh, you know, think very high, over 90% uh, utilization right now. And, and that's the way we want to keep it. We don't want to, um, you know, dip down because, as you know, that has a lot of cost implications back into the business, and we want to make sure we maintain this fabs running full. So the greater 90% is both for hidden media fabs. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you. And our next question comes from Carl Ackerman with PMB Paribas. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I was hoping you could discuss your build-to-order visibility uh, and whether it's based on take-or-pay contracts or if it would be better characterized uh, as strong indications of interest as you and customers plan their storage capacity additions over the coming quarters. Uh, and secondarily, if I may sneak in another one, I'm just hoping you could also discuss the mix of SMR today and perhaps going forward as we think about uh, the, the mix of these higher capacity products going into December and into 2025. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Uh, you know, I'll let John Luca do the build to order question. Uh, just on the SMR, I, I, I say this many times, there's only a couple of cloud customers that really take SMR. There's a couple uh, client server customers that take SMR as well, so we ship it into multiple markets. But um, you know, we, we talk about SMR versus CMR, but I, I just look at it as drives, drives, how does the customer need them? And, and we can configure them for those applications for those particular customers, whether it's one or two people uh, accordingly. Um, from, from my perspective, we have a great technology set that we can deploy every place, and we'll try to keep those factories as full as we possibly can and maximize it. Um, so that's, that's how I think about the SMR mix. Yeah, on the build to order, you know, we have different uh, kind of agreements with different customers, but uh, the vast majority are orders that are full, fully committed by, by customers um, out in time. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Dave Mosley for any closing remarks. Oh, thanks, Nick. Our strategic improvements in advanced technology roadmap position us well to meet evolving customer needs and drive future growth. We remain committed to delivering value and scalable storage solutions for our customers. I'd like to thank our dedicated team, our supply chain partners, and our shareholders for your continued support. Thanks. Talk to you next quarter.